So we talked about the ways that we can get water in and water out, maintain homeostasis. What happens if something goes wrong and we don't maintain proper water and fluid homeostasis? Let's talk about two concepts here, and I want, I want you to keep them separate, all right? One is volume depletion, which we're going to call hypovolemia. That means you've lost a total amount of fluid from your body. That means both water and solutes. We're going to contrast that with dehydration, which means only water is lost. Okay? So once again, hypovolemia, you've lost total fluid, which means you've lost water and solutes, whereas dehydration, you've only lost water. So let's take a look. Volume depletion, hypovolemia. Lose water and solutes. When would this happen? Well, like a hemorrhage, all right, upper right. If you're losing blood, you're losing blood plasma, remember, which is mostly water, and then you're losing solutes as well. So what's going to happen is your total body water is going to go down, and your osmolarity is going to stay normal. Why? Once again, osmolarity is the proportion of solutes in the fluid. If you're losing both water and solutes, then the proportion is staying the same, okay? So, osmolarity stays the same during volume depletion. Hemorrhage, severe burns, chronic vomiting, diarrhea, those could all cause hypovolemia. You're losing both water and solutes. In contrast, dehydration is losing only water. Total body water goes down, therefore osmotic pressure is going to change, all right? Because here we're losing only water, not solutes. Therefore, the proportion of the total that solutes make up is going to keep getting larger and larger. They'll stay the same, but as water goes down, osmotic pressure goes up, okay? Could be lack of drinking water, diabetes, maybe profuse sweating, although normally that's losing electrolytes as well. Diuretics sometimes, some drugs that people are taking. So it's possible to become dehydrated, losing just water, not the solutes. Infants are more vulnerable to this for a lot of reasons. They have a higher metabolic rate. They make more urine. Kidneys are not as efficient yet. The, the whole uh, Hoff's Law ratio of body surface to mass. Um, it's funny, sometimes I'm uh, out on my bicycle and I try to stay on the streets, but sometimes I use these little multi use paths to get in between the streets. And um, I'll see, you know, there's everything on there. You know, skaters and skateboarders and parents walking their kids in strollers. And I'll be coming up on, I'll be coming towards parents walking a kid in a stroller. And I'll see the parents, you know, they both got on. You know, they're glistening from all the sunscreen and they've got sunglasses on. And they're baby. I, I see the baby. It's like bright pink, squinting into the sun, no sunglasses. And I stop and I say, are you planning on eating your child for dinner tonight? And they're, what? I'm going, well, you're, you're cooking. Look at, your, look at your baby, damn it. You've been cooking this kid. You can see them. You know, and this, these are the kinds of things you would see. Sunken font nails, sunken eyes or cheeks, just decreased skin turgers. So you pinch the skin, doesn't snap back. Sunken abdomen, dry mouth or tongue, fewer no tears. Um, you got to be careful. Kids, you know, in really hot weather, you got to, you know, don't just take care of yourself and your animals too. Take care of your dog and stuff. Affects all fluid compartments, of course, because it's losing water everywhere in the body. What are the most serious effects? Circulatory shock, neurological dysfunction, infant mortality. Um, yeah, water balance is, is uh, life-threatening, potentially. Okay. So we talked about not having enough water. Let's talk about having too much water. What if you got too much fluid excess? Volume excess, total volume. So again, both water and solutes here. Both sodium and water retain ECF isotonic. Um, so we're not going to have a change in osmolarity here. If we uh, retain too much fluid, totally water and solutes, osmotic pressure stays the same. Um, aldosterone hypersecretion, for example. All right, so you make too much aldosterone. Remember, aldosterone saves sodium, so you pull extra sodium in, therefore you pull extra water in. So your total volume is going to go up, but not the osmotic pressure because you're pulling in solutes and water at the same time. Okay, you're going to have way too much water, and you're going to have blood pressure is going to be too high too. Um, hypotonic hydration. So what does that mean? Hypotonic hydration. Think about when you're uh, sweating, um, would be one example, and you're, well, actually, let's not go there. Let's start with the other uh, side. 
Uh, more water than sodium retained or ingested. So ECF hypotonic can cause cellular swelling. What we're talking about now is if you just start chugging water, all right, um, and you keep drinking, 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 you're going to increase the total volume of water in your extracellular fluid, but you're not changing the solutes. So now we're changing osmotic pressure, all right. We are causing the ECF to become hypotonic. It's low osmotic pressure. It doesn't have as much, the proportion of solutes is not as high as it should be relative to the fluid. So what's going to happen? Well, remember, can water get across membranes? Yeah, remember from the first day of class, it's really tiny, it can wiggle right across. So you've got the two big compartments of your body, ECF and ICF. Well, if the ECF becomes hypotonic, then remember, water is going to follow solutes. We're always going to even out the osmotic pressure. So what that's going to do is the cells of your body are going to start trying to pull that excess water from the ECF into the cells, and you get cellular swelling. That's the danger of hypotonic hydration. Um, you see this every once in a while, like in fraternity initiations or something. People have to chug water, and it causes their brainstem to swell, and they die. Most serious effects, pulmonary and cerebral edema. All right, Either your lungs or your brain start filling up with water. So take a look uh, on, the, on the left. It's showing what I'm talking about here. When you move fluid and solutes, you, know, you change osmotic pressure depending on whether you move both or just one. Okay, And the woman there, anybody know who that woman is? It's her. Her name is Jennifer Strange. She was 28 years old, and she was in a contest for a radio station called something like Don't We to Win a We, you know, We the Game Station. So these people in the contest had to drink as much water as possible, but they couldn't pee if they urinated. If they went to the bathroom, they were automatically disqualified. So what they were doing was they were intentionally causing themselves to become severely hypotonically hydrated. So as they drank more and more water, the osmotic pressure of their ECF became less and less, and therefore the cells of their body started pulling water in. Um, so at one point during the contest, it was great. Uh, can you get water poison and, like, die, asked the female disc jockey. Not with water, a male disc jockey replied. Your body is 98% water. Don't you love it? Just the confidence. 98%. We're not even in the right quartile, but this guy is positive. Why can't you take in as much water as you want? Well, you can, actually, as long as you pee. That's fine. Everything's fine. That's why we have a urinary system. One reason. Maybe we should have researched this before, says a female jockey. Yeah, right. Ten plays were fired. She went home, she wasn't feeling good, and she laid down, she died. Um, her brain stem swelled, cut off, you know, her breathing, her heart, stuff like that. So and that's how the fraternity applicants die as well, uh, initiates, whatever. Um, yeah, hypotonically hydrate. You can kill yourself. Pulmonary cerebral edema. Total blood volume, fluid intake. So look at what's going on here. Normally, too much water is not a problem. Why? Look at the far right chart, water diuresis. In other words, if you drink too much water, you just pee it out. Um, on the other hand, your body can't make up for not having enough water. What happens in that case? Go far left, hypovolemia, and then death. Special um, state that we call people who don't have below like three uh, liters of blood. Kidneys can compensate very well for excess. Yeah, just pee. You can't do anything about it. Not enough. So fluid sequestration, this means keeping fluids sequestered one place. Sequestered. I do, just to find something in terms of the word itself. I'm a professional. Don't try this at home. It means holding a fluid someplace where it's not normally uh, should be concentrated like that. Excess fluid in a particular location. Thank God, finally, the text to find it for me. Um, most common form is edema, all right? Just swelling. You know, you sprain your ankle. Yeah, right. It swells up. Water. That's what's going on in the interstitial spaces. Hematomas, this is where blood, you know, accumulates. Hemorrhage in the tissues. That woman there on her arm, that's a hematoma. Um, so, uh, I don't know. What do, you, what do you think caused that? I was asking class. People can guess. Some people say, like, baseballs or softballs or tennis balls or whatever. And I don't think it's any of those. I think it's a racquetball. 
Um, and I think that because um, I played baseball and softball for a long time, and I got hit a lot because I was a pitcher and I played third base. I got hit by balls all the time, and I had big hematomas like that. But when you get them from a softball or baseball or tennis ball, you can see where the stitching or where the lines are. You can see the little light spots, and she doesn't have those. So I don't think I think that's a racquetball. Um, hematoma blood has lost circulation. In other words, blood that should be circulating is now in that little blob right there. It's usually not a big deal. It could be, though. It can be under certain circumstances. Pleural effusions. So fluid can accumulate in some lung infections. This is very bad. Now we're talking, you know, basically coronavirus here. And when fluid accumulates, you know, there's uh, inflammation, you know, the mucus and all the stuff and the excess fluid. And you can't breathe. You suffocate. You can't exchange gases. That respiratory membrane has got to stay clear in order for gases to get across. Electrolytes. We now start talking about electrolytes. These are the main solutes that we're dealing with in this part of the class. That's what we're mostly looking at. So, well, they do lots of metabolic things, all right, certainly. We've seen all the way along. I mean, you know, chloride shifts and stuff like that, all the pumps that require sodium, potassium, and hydrogen, everything. Determine the cell membrane potentials, right? Remember in studying the nervous system, voltage gated sodium and potassium, and then the, uh, those did the action potential, and then we had the ligand gated channels and so on, so and the, the leakage channels. Affect osmolarity of body fluids definitely. I mean, osmotic pressure, solutes, electrolytes are solutes. Affect the body's uh, water content and distribution because, again, water follows solutes. So water is going to go where the electrolytes are. Major cations, we know this already, sodium, potassium, uh, calcium, hydrogen. Sodium, the main cation of the extracellular fluid. Potassium, the main of the intracellular. Major anions, chloride, bicarbonate, and phosphate. All right, Chloride, extracellular, bicarbonate, extracellular phosphate intracellular. We covered all that day one, so this is just review. You should have this down solid by this point. And uh, do you think this is a big deal in nursing and healthcare? Yeah, look in the upper right. That's what happens, and I've had people say they've seen this too. Like, you know, uh, somebody, you know, their arm swells up to like twice its size because a nurse set the drip wrong. Um, those things happen. It's easy to, uh, it's easy to kill people with electrolytes, so uh, pay attention. So talking about the functions of sodium, um, you already know a lot about this because we talked about this on day one we've talked about it ever since. So remember membrane potentials, um, you know, the resting membrane potential? That's governed in large part because of the sodium-potassium pump, which maintains a concentration gradient of sodium in the extracellular fluid and potassium in the intracellular fluid. So. Sodium, the most important um, factor in the osmolarity of the ECF. Um, that's why sodium imbalances cause imbalances of osmotic pressure. Sodium potassium pump, we just mentioned, exchanges cell, uh, sodium for potassium, pumps sodium out, some pumps potassium inside the cell membrane, um, creates that concentration gradient that your body uses in so many ways. The sodium glucose transporter, remember, um, takes advantage of that in order to move glucose um, across membranes. Um, sodium potassium pump generates heat. It run, accounts for about 40% of your ATP at rest. So, pretty big deal, sodium in the body. And um, again, the sodium ion be, uh, being the main cation of the ECF, uh, there's also bicarb, um, which is a main anion of the ECF, so a sodium bicarbonate is a buffer. We've always said the bicarbonate ion is a buffer. You can think of it as being sodium bicarb, which you may have at home in the form of a box of baking soda. Sodium homeostasis. The biggest problem that we generally have, at least in this country and most of Western civilization, I think, is that we put too much sodium into our bodies. Um, you need about half a gram a day. You typically have way more than that because of all the processed foods, all those chips, even all those boxed foods. Um, they normally have a lot of sodium in them. Soups, oh my God, they're so high in sodium. So that's our main problem is just getting rid of all the excess. Um, so hormones that work on uh, sodium in order to try to maintain sodium balance, well, aldosterone, the save salt or save sodium hormone. Um, 
Remember that worked by increasing the number of sodium potassium pumps in the nephron tubules. So you pump sodium back in. Aldosterone, remember, released as part of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. Um, when blood pressure is low, that activates that whole system. Aldosterone will pump sodium back into the blood. Water follows. Stroke volume goes up. Blood pressure goes up. And um, hypernatremia, hypokalemia will inhibit the release of aldosterone. Think about it. Hypernatremia, if you already got too much sodium in your blood, you don't want more. And likewise, hypokalemia, because remember, since aldosterone works by increasing the number of sodium potassium pumps, at the same time that it's pumping sodium in, it's pumping potassium out. So too much aldosterone will pump too much potassium out. So if you're already hypokalemic, you don't want to release aldosterone, and that will exacerbate that condition. ADH increases blood sodium, well, increased blood sodium levels stimulate ADH release. ADH, remember, moves water without moving sodium, so that's the way you can control osmolarity. See, aldosterone won't affect osmolarity because it's moving water and solutes at the same time. ADH, because it moves water only, will uh, affect osmolarity, and that's why your body can use a combination of aldosterone and ADH to control both sodium and water and subsequently osmotic pressure. Kidneys, in this case, reabsorb more water, and remember the way it did that was by increasing the number of aquaporin channels in the nephron tubules. ANP, in a certain uh, sense, is the opposite of aldosterone. Remember, this was released in response to increased pressure in the atrium. Um, releases The heart releases ANP. That will cause you to secrete more sodium into the urine. Water follows. Therefore, um, your total stroke volume goes down and your blood pressure goes down, and you'll pee more. Remember, A and P always need to pee. Estrogen mimics the effect of aldosterone during pregnancy, and progesterone has a diuretic effect throughout the menstrual cycle. Um, that's why, you know, the, and the whole bloated everything, so, yeah, oh my God, you poor women dealing with all that stuff, so. Sodium imbalances are a big deal. Um, they can cause some serious consequences. So, first of all, hypernatremia, that's a plasma sodium over 145 milliequivalents per liter. You don't have to know that number for me. Um, you will if you're going to be a nurse. How can things like that happen? Yeah, IV saline. So, nurses, you know, you set that drip and uh, you set it wrong. Sometimes you don't get back to the room for another hour. And uh, holy smoke, you come back in, the patient's arm is swollen to three times its size. And I've heard of that happening more than once. Um, because remember, sodium ECF is going to pull water, so you end up with too much water in the ECF. So water retention, hypertension, and edema. So, yeah, it happens more often than you might think. Hyponatremia, um, equally if not more serious, um, plasma sodium under 130 milliequivalents per liter. Don't have to know that number for me. Um, too much water can cause this. So remember that poor woman in the radio station contest, don't we to win a we. Um, what happens is too much water in the ECF, um, therefore proportionally osmolarity less, therefore water starts going into the ICF, goes into the cells, and you end up with pulmonary or cerebral edema. Um, that's how she died. Um, can also result from uh, hiking outside in hot weather. You sweat like crazy, you lose water and salt, and you drink nothing but water, you'll become hyponatremic. That's called exertional hyponatremia. And the Grand Canyon says that's the number one cause for emergency medical treatment. It's more serious than dehydration. Um, rangers there carry, they look like the blood glucose meters, you know, the diabetics use, but they test blood sodium. If they see somebody who looks like they're in trouble on a trail, first thing they do is test blood sodium. If blood sodium is normal, they give them water. If blood sodium is not normal, then they give them salty snacks, you know, crackers, pretzels, things like that. Because if you give water to someone who is already hyponatremic, you'll make it worse. I think I've told you before about that poor young woman here in the Tucson area. Um, it was her graduation trip. They were hiking in the Tortolitas in June, a very hot day. She was feeling terrible. Everybody kept telling her, drink more water, drink more water. And um, when the paramedics found her, they sent in a helicopter, she was vomiting water. And why? 
because basically her brainstem knew, her hypothalamus, her brainstem, that more water was going to kill her. So they were trying to get it out of her system. What she needed was salt, not water. So in the lower right, you see there a little kid who died of hypernatremia. This is a bizarre story, and I don't know exactly what was going on there. There were allegations of child abuse and so on. But the kid may have had an eating disorder, but he ate way too much salty stuff, and his parents apparently tried to punish him to get him to stop eating by giving him very salty foods. I don't know the full story, but he died of hypernatremia. In the upper right-hand corner, this is a great, I got this from a veterinary textbook. Look at this. This is really good. Look at the horse on the left. Has a, is 5% dehydrated, but has a relatively normal sodium concentration in its blood. And that horse is thinking, boy, could I go for a good long drink. Yeah, right. Look at the horse on the right. It's 10% dehydrated, so its dehydration is worse. But this horse is thinking, I won't drink even if they lead me to water. Have you heard the old saying, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink? Yeah, and that's because, and this has happened to me um, hiking, I've become hyponatremic, and it's a terrible feeling. Water sounds revolting at that point. Even though you're dehydrated, the thought of drinking water just makes you sick to your stomach. The problem is that your hypothalamus knows that the problem is that you're hyponatremic. And if you drink more water, it's going to make it worse. You're going to get cerebral pulmonary edema, you're going to die. So, um, again, the rangers at the Grand Canyon carry the sodium meters, and if you're in trouble and it's not enough sodium, you have to eat salty foods, you can't drink water. Drinking water may potentially kill you. So, yeah, here I am. I hiked the Lava Falls route. This is back in 2009. Um, the Grand Canyon has now removed all references to this. It's not a trail. Um, it's a route. There's an occasional cairn. You're basically finding your own way down a big lava uh, scree slope, basically, um, although there are some steep drop-offs and things as well. But it's only a mile and a half long, so a lot of people think, well, I can hike that. But, yeah, it changes over 2,500 feet. That's an average grade of like 30 to 40 percent. So you're on all fours a lot of the time. And in summer, you can see there it's 98 degrees when I made it back up to the top. Um, it was 120 at the bottom. But, um, yeah, they, the Grand Canyon removed all the references to this because they got tired of cleaning up all the dead bodies is what it came down to. So I was even there one year when somebody just died just before me. So um, this guy, 39, um, he didn't carry enough water. All these people think, well, I'll carry just like, you know, a liter of water. No, you'll, you're going to die. So he was hyponatremic. He fell to his death. Um, this guy, Gavin Smith, 30, hyponatremic dehydration. He and some other guys went down and about halfway down, I guess, he decided he wasn't going to do it. And he tried to make it back. They found him only a hundred yards from the trailhead and i heard that this girl the story i got I, from a blm person um one of their rangers or whatever said that she and her boyfriend i guess were kayaking down the grand canyon and they got in a fight and she had had a book that said you know she could hike out at lava falls so she made him she got off the kayak and she tried to hike up and of course didn't have enough water and she died that's what happens um rest in peace all you people i'm so sorry could have been me too um, under extreme conditions, you can sweat up to 90 milliequivalents per hour of sodium. Gatorade supplies 20 per liter. All right, so think of every every quart of Gatorade is going to give you like 20. All right, you can sweat out 90 per hour. Expected ascent time for the Lava Falls route the Grand Canyon is six hours. All right, that's how long it took me, and that's how long some people have made it like in three and stuff. But it's typical, um, six hours. Let's say you do. How many liters of Gatorade will you need to pre uh, to drink to prevent hyponatremia? Well, it's six hours. You're sweating out 90 per hour. Every quart of Gatorade is giving you back like 20. So every liter. So how much? Yeah, 27 liters, about seven gallons. That's how much water you're going to need to drink on the way up. Now, have you ever tried carrying seven gallons in your pack? That's over 50 pounds. Plus, I don't know. I mean, nobody carries seven gallons. What I ended up doing was... On my way down, I cached water. I had these two uh, liter bags of water, um, these pouches, 
and I put them at one fourth of the way down, half the way down, three fourths of the way down. Therefore, as I hiked back up, as I would get to each point, I would have a half a gallon waiting for me. Even at that, and I had a gallon and a half in my backpack. And once I got to the bottom, I drank river water like crazy for a while. I mean, after filtering it to make sure I was totally hydrated when I started up. Still, when I made it to the top, I was in trouble. I was really hyponatremic at that point. I was feeling awful. I basically sprinted to my truck when I got done and ate a bunch of salty foods and chugged like two liters of uh, Gatorade. So, okay, kids, I'll see you in the next one. Yeah, here's Point Sublime late in the day. You can see a little bit of the Colorado River out there. I'll buy whatever rapids. I can't remember what those are. Point Sublime. It's sublime. <laughs>